right, all right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of BIM After Dark Live. My name is Jeff, also known as the Revit Kid. Thank you for joining me today on this special time, uh, 12.30. I know a lot of you guys are used to seeing darkness in the background and cars driving by. Um, today, we've got a little lightness. It's uh, 12.30 p.m. Eastern time, um, which is actually where my, where my guest is from, also Eastern time. Uh, today, we are going to uh, uh, interview a, a person that you guys are probably all familiar with. Um, and it's going to be, I think it's going to be a, a fascinating interview, and I hope you guys enjoy it. We're going to be talking about not just architectural practice um, uh, when it comes to residential um, and and the ethos behind uh, how, how our guest Eric approaches design, how he got to where he is, but also sort of um, his interesting take on technology. Um, I think on this channel, I know a lot of the audience uh, based on what I do, uh, we're very much technology enthused uh, individuals when it comes to architecture and engineering, and it's easy for us to forget about um, the big picture of being an architect, the big picture of being an engineer, um, and focus slowly on, solely on the tools, and I'm completely uh, uh, you know, guilty of that as well. So I think this will be a great episode, hopefully refreshing for everyone, to take a step back from the deep, deep abyss that is Revit and BIM, um, and just talk about architecture uh, as a whole. So I'm, I'm super excited for this. Um, if you're here live, remember, chat. Um, I will keep an eye on it. I will feed in questions as we go along. Um, uh, and so definitely feel free to ask your questions. Um, with that, I will, I will, I will bring in our guest um, because I don't want him to sit there for too long uh, and, 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 and look at me staring and talking to you guys. Um, Eric Reinhold, welcome to the show, man. Hey, thanks, Jeff, man. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Um, oh. uh, thanks for accommodating my uh, my old man schedule. You know, I'm, I'm nearing my 50s, so I, I go to bed earlier than the rest of you guys. It's all good. It's funny because the reason I do nine o'clock is so that it's after all the kids go to bed and then I can oh, do it. Right. So there's not as much distraction around. But uh, no, of course, it definitely definitely worth worth the accommodation so i appreciate you coming on um i didn't do a full bio coming into it um i think a lot of people probably know who you are but i, I do want to run through it a little bit um you know we call you an architect but you're definitely an architect and entrepreneur um if you guys don't know um, and i'm sure we'll talk about this but eric's got books out he's got uh you know physical products out like like writing pads and and, and trace that's your vellum your trace one which i absolutely love um he's got a, a ridiculously awesome youtube channel um and and more um, so if you haven't heard of Eric, head on over to 30 by 40 design workshop on YouTube, which I have it linked below. Um, I'm sure you have if you guys are in the architectural realm. I don't know if you know this, Eric, but um, I did a little research beforehand. And I think the only channel that has more subscribers than you in the field of architecture is Architectural Digest. <laughs> Oh, okay. I don't know if right you knew on, that. Man. Yeah. I don't know if you knew that. Uh, and that's not fair because that. they do the open door series with like like Pink and like Lady Gaga. So like they, they have a little oh, bit right. of a you know a little bit of a, a different audience. But um, but as far as I can tell, um, I couldn't find any architectural channel that had more than a million subscribers. So congratulations on that, man. Thanks, man. No, I really appreciate that. Yeah, and I I try not to pay attention to it too much because when you make you know something for a million people, it feels like. A lot of pressure, I have to say. <laughs> I, I, I mean, kudos on that. I mean, I, I know uh, uh, getting getting even to uh, 100,000 subscribers is a lot of work. Getting to a million, I, I can't even fathom. But uh, it, it just it goes to show the, the, the quality of the content that you're putting out on that channel. And like I said, I think everyone here probably has seen one or two of your videos. If not, um, then they probably haven't been watching architecture on, on YouTube. So, <laughs> so um, with that, I think maybe um, I was I was going to do a quick five minute bio, but I think what we'll do is maybe we'll just talk through it. Um, um, I think everyone here, uh, as much as they may have seen your content, uh, maybe they they've they've run across some of your videos. Maybe they've run across some of your um, awesome resources on your website, um, which we can get into as well. Some of your um, great packages of toolkits like um, your uh, standard operating procedures and, and documents like that and some of your procreate and all that stuff um, maybe we just start with with like who who's Eric Reinhold what where, like where, where where did this all begin man how, how how did you let's start with architecture like how did you begin in this this realm of architecture I mean I I had into architecture with a pretty naive notion of what it meant to be an architect you know I grew up in the 70s uh, I was watching the Brady Bunch. So Mike Brady, the, the father of that household was an architect. And I saw what he did as something really alluring to me. I love to draw. I love technical drawing in particular, sketching. I love building models. You know, I was a big model train enthusiast. And so my vision of what an architect did was pretty simplistic. Um, and, and that is how I chose architecture, got into school. And then I realized it was all this kind of volume of 
other cool things, you know, mm-hmm. theory and history and the technical aspects of it, in addition to all of the creative drawing model building things. Um, and so that's really what led me to architecture school. And, you know, beyond architecture school, probably like a lot of people in the audience here, I got into practice and as an intern, and I found a real disconnect between what I learned in school and the real creative design process oriented work and the technical aspects of actually executing and building a building. I don't feel like that school really prepared me for what the reality of practice was like. And so I spent a number of years doing institutional, commercial, educational work. um, And I found that work to be pretty uninspiring and it was not lighting me up. It was, it was a complete disconnect. I was drafting toilet plans for hundred thousand square foot schools and renovations. And I was like, is this really what I wanted to do? I always wanted to design houses, you know, kind of like the Mike Brady thing. And so uh, my wife ended up getting a job up here in Maine where we're living now. And the architects that practiced around here, they all did high end residential work. And for me, that was just, that was a complete connection to why I pursued architecture in the first place. And so I practiced for a number of years with uh, an award winning architectural firm uh, local uh, to this part of Maine. And I was able to work on a number of projects that I obviously wouldn't have gotten on my own just coming straight out of school or as a young intern. And so I was able to build up a nice portfolio of work Um, about 10 years ago, um, which is when I started my business, uh, that firm, you know, the the recession uh, was sort of grinding out the bottom of uh, 2012 Mm -hmm. and they ended up sort of losing a couple of projects and they cut our pay in the office. It was this office of six cut our pay by 20%. And they basically said, look, you can invest, you know, the one day a week that we're not paying you at, back into the firm. We can build up a new stable of clients or you can sort of head out on your own and find some moonlighting work. And I took that as a chance to really step out and say, I'm going to start my own business. I always wanted my own business. The timing never really seemed right. Um, so I used that as an opportunity to start 30 by 40 design workshops. So the business is 10 years old this year. And um, Congrats on that. when I, yeah, thanks, man. Yeah, it, it, that feels like a real number. Um, but when I started that that business, um, I started it in the vein that probably every other sole practitioner does, you know, serving clients mm-hmm. one at a time. I was trading time for dollars. And it was in the vein of the previous business that I was working for. And I took on all of those like small projects. And I'm sure you've been there too, right? You start with a renovation and well, you get to a certain point and they put it on hold and you're like, oh, I need another project and another. <laughs> and, and so I built up this kind of big stable of projects and I realized it was too much for me to handle as a sole practitioner. Um, and so I needed a way to kind of reinvent practice. And so the entrepreneurial business model that I you know, sort of invented for myself was to split the business into two halves. So one side was a product side and the other side was a services side. And what I did with the services side was just say, I'm going to work with like one or two clients at a time. And then all of that work that I'm doing there, all the byproducts of that design process, I'm going to see if I can monetize those and productize those in a way that can support and feed back into the services side. So there's like this symbiotic relationship in the business now. And, you know, over time I've expanded that to, like you said, include things like sketchbooks and physical products. Um, I'm just running all of these experiments and the YouTube channel was one of the experiments that I ran early on that has been pretty successful. That's kind of a business on its own right yeah. now. The, so, so, I mean, on that note, um, you know, I think, uh, I think it's pretty common for, for us architects to have uh, other passions or skill. I, I, I feel like I haven't met another architect who hasn't like painted or, or photography. Right. It was just, I don't know, cause maybe the art side of it. Um, you know, one of the things that's, that's always been great about your videos is the high production quality. I think from the beginning, for the most part, it seemed like you, you, you paid even on your earlier videos, right? You still paid a lot of attention to the, to the production quality. I mean, yeah, obviously it gets better over time. Come on. We all get better over time. Sure. Right, um, right. Was that, was that, was that just sort of a personal aesthetic thing that because of, you know, just your design background, I mean, that you, 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 you were meticulous about making that or was that sort of is photography slash the videography was that also something that you were interested in um, and it was this nice little symbiotic relationship between the two arts let's say <laughs> yeah it's a great question and i love talking about Woodwork- this because- somebody just said woodworking that's another great one right architects and right. <laughs> they, they always have something right <laughs> totally yeah and Luth- Luth- years right architects making guitars and stuff <laughs> totally man i mean to be honest it, this was i hadn't picked up a camera before 2013. Hmm. I mean, I just never did. And and what I found was uh, a love for the act of um, composing a photograph hmm. and 
you know, then composing video and all of the sort of technical side of it. And I think, you know, maybe that this is how this discussion evolves and that there is an analog side to the work that I do. And there's also a real highly digital side of, of the work that I do that there's this symbiotic relationship between the two and they feed each other. And so when I picked up a camera and actually the pivot point there, you know, it's one thing to pick, pick up a camera and try and edit in Final Cut or iMovie or whatever I was right. using back then. And it, it's quite another to make something that someone finds visually appealing mm -hmm. and, and then also add in the layer of storytelling to keep someone interested right. in in the content. And so to me, it opened up, it was like opening this door into this room that I didn't even know existed. Like mm -hmm. if I had picked up a camera when I was 16, I might've gone another direction. I mean, mm -hmm. I might've gone into filmmaking because I just realized this was a door I had never opened before. And, and what I like about the kind of, you know, the workshop that I built here, this is this kind of creative space mm -hmm. for me to pursue all of those things. Right. Like I want it to be model making, I want it to be filmmaking and video and photography and letterpress and, you know, writing, like all of these things. And so, um, you know, it wasn't a conscious act to get back to your question about wanting to create a quality video. But when in 2017, I hired somebody to make a short film um, mm -hmm. about my kind of journey and yeah. it's called The Choice to Make and it's on my channel. You can see it there. Um, and, and what I realized when I made that film and I hired a couple of people to do that was oh, there's a storytelling aspect to this mm. that I was really bad at. And that person <laughs> who I hired helped me get better at storytelling. Yeah. And then there was a, you know, a videographer who was taught me amazing things about composition mm. and, you know, white balance and all the technical aspects here. And then there was someone, there was an editor on the back end who was cutting this thing in a way that I saw the possibility there. And I mm. thought, oh, I have so much more to learn. And, you know, obviously I think any architect would tell you we're never done learning. Um, any mm. filmmaker is going to say the same thing. And, you know, this creative space is just, it gets bigger and bigger every year. And that I find really exciting and interesting rather than this kind of singular definition of, you know, me as an architect, which is what I saw myself 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. Now that, that vision has expanded and I, I imagine it's the same for you, right? Right. Yep. 100%. So I'm, I'm interested actually, um, uh, because I think, I think folks out there who maybe, maybe on the same path, maybe at the point where you were saying where you just got out of school, you're, you're, you jumped into the intern world and you're, you're laying out ADA plans and bathrooms, whatever. Right. Um, I think a lot of us have gone down that, um, you're, you're in a unique part of the country <laughs> in Maine up there. And, and especially out in desert islands, like I, you know, being a Northeast guy, New England guy, you know, I'm sort of, I think it is, do you, do you feel like that, that alone, that location difference between uh, where, where was it that you moved before, before you went up to Maine? Uh, Central Connecticut, uh, Hartford area. <laughs> a different, yeah. yeah, exactly. Right, right down the street. <laughs> I, I knew that. And I just, uh, I thought there was an in-between when you went to school, but I guess that was the same. That was where you moved from. So, um, yeah, yeah. Which, you know, again, it's, it's, obviously different than other parts of the country as well, but definitely a little different than, than the type of work that would be up in, up where you are. Do you, do you feel like that had a big influence on, on the way you're practicing your design aesthetic and the type of projects that you were like, like, do you think you could have done the same thing in a completely different part of, of the country or would it, would it have been a different, you think it would have been a different sort of, the firm would have maybe built, been built, built differently. Cause you, I think you, it's, I, I guess what I'm getting at is I think where you are, you're in a unique spot where I feel like, the 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 market sector there like you said is it's very driven by that type of work right the high-end custom residential work there's not a lot of you know huge towers going up in 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 that part of maine right i mean there's some but not, not sure. really right uh so so, yeah. so i'm curious like do you, do you feel like if if you didn't have that move to maine um for whatever reason it was for your wife etc um and you had to move to i don't know schenectady new york or something no offense to schenectady i'm just but it's just <laughs> naming it out there would you think it would have impacted the the how you built that firm how you built 30 by 40. Of course. I mean, I, I think there's there's no denying that if there's a, a local services component to your work, that there's no denying if you're going to try and make, build a body of work around whatever work you're trying to do locally. But, you know, to be to be fair, I've done projects in Utah. I've done projects in California. I've done projects in Australia. Yeah. Like, I mean, the Internet has allowed us to be not constrained by geography anymore like that. That is no longer a constraint. Now, is it different kind of work? Do I have a different connection to the project that I did in Australia to the one that, you know, I do down the road here? Of course mm -hmm. I do. Um, but I, I, I think it's um, it's a fallacy to think that it can only happen in these sort of pockets of high end residential work. I right. there are plenty of people and, you know, I have a course teaching people how to do this. Um, and there are plenty of people that I interact with that are that are making this happen in, in many different 
markets, locations, and using, you know, an entrepreneurial skill set doesn't just have to apply to, you know, architecture. It can be many other things. And I think architecture is one arm of my practice, but it's not the only thing that feeds me creatively. And that, for me, is the thing that's really freeing about creating a, a business like I have, um, that I can dip in and dip it out of these interests as as I find them, you know, compelling or as they present themselves. And I think, um, you know, building a, an audience, a social media following, like that can, I didn't have a lot of work when I started this business, man. I like, right. I was inventing projects, you know? I mean, so does it have, and obviously, honestly, some people don't know that some of the work on the channel itself is invented. Like right. they're invented projects. You're seeing things that, okay, maybe they, it was a start. It was a fit and a start and we did this and mm -hmm. it did, it went no further. I mean, you know that you have plenty of people who come in and kick the tires and you start doing a little bit of stuff. Yeah. So, I mean, this can happen in any particular way. I think there's a, this kind of limiting belief saying, well, I'm not in his location. I don't have clients like that. And therefore I can't replicate that business model. I just think that's, that's wrong. Oh, I love that. And it, it also brings me to the to the question, too, of <clears throat> of like I, I see and I think around maybe 13 or 14 is kind of when, when you and I also started sort of connecting um, sure. mainly on, you know, the, that online entrepreneurial figuring out all these different facets of 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 productizing and, and, and whatnot. Um, and I'm curious sort of your thoughts on this is like, do you see because because in my opinion, um, uh, I think doing what you're doing is sort of the which which again is not necessarily splitting splitting up the the income baskets let's say um but really just just building building an audience building that that platform using all these online tools etc um i mean do you see that as sort of a, a becoming more of like a basic standard now for for solo architectural practice do you think that i mean what do you what do you because obviously there's plenty of people doing it without that right but i have to imagine you know maybe because i live in this world that um, the the benefits to that process change change the entire approach to the, the traditional architectural practice, which you know the marketing side of it, right? I mean, I have to imagine most of it's the referrals basis, et cetera, as opposed to now, you know, like you said, someone can see the outpost video in Australia and be like, hey, that's a really cool project. You know, I know you're in <laughs> you're in Maine, but hey, can can you know, I'm I'm thinking of something similar. Um, you know, do you sort of see that as like being now? Um, uh, for a successful practice being sort of something to think about as sort of a standard of, of how we do things? I just think it's, it makes your job so much easier. You know, when you have an audience, <laughs> of course it's gonna, I mean, if I can put uh, you know, an image on my Instagram and it reach 90,000 people, mm -hmm. someone's gonna see that and think something and it just opens new doors. So do I think it's, you know, a prerequisite? No, not necessarily. I mean, this it's, traditional marketing still works. There's still billboards, right? right. I mean, it's just right. where are people putting their attention? And, you know, for a lot of people, that may be on TikTok. Um, for another subset of people, it may be on Facebook. And, you know, but I, I'm just not going to ignore YouTube, which is the second largest search engine in the world. Like, to me, that's just, that's silly to, uh, to do that. And I think it requires you know, on the model that I've created for my own business, which I think is something that anyone can replicate, you know, it requires you doing the work, number one, so you have a project, whatever that is, invented or otherwise, right. and then putting a camera over your desk while you're doing the work and yeah. saying like, this is what I'm doing. Yeah. I mean, there are so many people in the world who will never get the chance to work with an architect. That's an exciting process to them. That's alluring. And, you know, we have the chance to expose whatever our process is, which is unique to us, mm -hmm. um, expose that to them and they, they get to see that. And whether or not they hire us, you know, maybe we can gain something off of that. You know, it doesn't have to be a transactional relationship, but right. helping others, you know, has been a great baseline strategy for my business to not only grow, um, you know, just Grow, feed me creatively, but also financially. It's mm -hmm. it's like it's very impactful. And I think you know, for people who are maybe younger, just coming out of school, I think having a social following is, I mean, that is currency 100%. in the world right now. I mean, yeah. I, there's no way I'd hire anyone in my business without looking at that. People mm -hmm. look at it. It's it's part of your, the value that you bring as an employee. And I think. Um, you know, you can curate that in the same way you do your portfolio. And I think over time, this technology is going to change and evolve. But having an audience and someone you can turn to when you make something new mm -hmm. is incredibly valuable. You know this, right? Yep. I mean, yourself, you've right. built an audience and 
it's very powerful to be able to send out an email and say, I just made this. What do you guys think? You know, yeah. uh, for connections, for new clients. I mean, I had someone reach out on Instagram. And they're like, I'm building this surf shack in California. I want you to be involved. It's like, how am I going to get? I mean, that's a California. That's not just down the road here. Right. <laughs> you know, I mean, and of course, it's built on the back of a portfolio of work and a, and a process and, and you putting yourself out there and saying, this is me. This is how I do. You know, this is what I do. And that naturally attracts people in your tribe, people who like what it is that you do. So, right. man, I, I can't see a firm actually building into you know the 2030s without having some idea what, what they're going to do for marketing via mm -hmm. social media. I don't see it as practical. 100%. Uh, I think one of the interesting things uh, for those who are getting inspired by this, because I'm hoping that's the case, right? It's, it's you know, th this is meant to be an inspiring discussion about it. Um, you know, there is there is a lot of uh, I know that there's always a, 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 a I don't know if it's an intimidation, um, not just necessarily of sort of being on camera, et cetera, but also sure. of sharing your process and how you do things. Um, I know I know for a fact that there's there's some people who have reservations doing that. Uh, for the sake of not sharing how they do things for other people, whether it be competition, whatever, um, you know, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on that. I mean, there's there's obvious. I think I think I think people who follow both of us will probably realize that we find you know we we have no problem sharing our processes and 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 the, how the sausage is made. But I think there may be people that are reluctant to do that, and so um, especially on the architecture side because we're always so damn cynical. Um, <laughs> I, yeah. I, I, I'm I'm sort of curious your opinions on that. You know if if you know what you're saying right there, it makes so much sense, right? Just you know even if it's your grandma's you know an addition above your grandma's garage, right? Just record the entire process and then share it. It doesn't you know in general. But there may be people who are like, well, I don't want to share that process, or I'm afraid to share it because of X, Y, and Z. Do you have any sort of thoughts on on that? Well, look, I, I mean, the more people who think like that, the better off you and I are. Because right. it's true, the, it's just less competition. So you yeah. have to think about, you know, I'd much rather play in a space where there's lower competition. Right. So, you know, if you truly feel that way and you feel like that's going to benefit your business in the long run, then that that's all the better for us. But what I would say <laughs> is that when you first start doing this and, you know, if anyone needs any confirmation of this, go back to the early videos in my channel. They're horrible. Like the very first video is embarrassing, but I keep <laughs> yeah. it there as a reminder for you know, what continued repeated practice can do for you. So when I first started sharing this stuff, nobody's watching. I mean, that's brilliant. That's the best possible outcome because it just lets me mm -hmm. repeat, rinse, repeat, rinse. Like I keep doing it over and over again. And, it be and with practice, obviously you're going to become better. You know, I mean, if you're just sharing your, your renovation to your family household in the very beginning, what, are you going to get 100 views on that? Who cares? 100 random people on the internet don't like the video I made about that edition. I don't really care because it's it's that's the thing, that repetition and the practice of it is the thing that's going to make me better as a professional. And someone, I mean, honestly, creating these videos, it, you know, it, and getting them to be engaging to an audience. I've made videos which they fall flat on their face, you know, even with a million subs, like <clears throat> you can find them. They're just out there. And, yeah. you know, not every video is going to hit with everybody. And I think at, the more I've grown the channel, the more pressure I've felt there. So, I, you know, I'm not I'm not dissimilar to you. Like I, every time I hit publish, man, I'm a little bit nervous. And mm -hmm. I think if you're not a little bit nervous when you're hitting publish on something, you're doing it wrong because you're waiting too long. You're polishing it too much. You know, if it's that perfect thing, by the time you publish it, it's too late. Yep. You just waited too long. And look, I, I mean, I went, just went through a period where I wasn't publishing videos for six months because I was just I was just burned out on the process of the whole thing. And I think, you know, you have to kind of fall in love with the idea that you are sharing your information and your expertise and and someone out there is going to find that helpful. And, mm -hmm. and so that's kind of the rubric that I always return to is like, who is the one person I'm making this for? Who can I help here? Like, what's the shortcut? There's a there's a gap in knowledge here right. and I can fill the gap in with this piece of content. And it can be really small and bite sized. It doesn't have to be a 20 minute video that is highly produced. You know, right now, a lot of the stuff that's hitting on YouTube is just low production it's like yeah. it's very contemporaneous it's like spontaneous you know mm -hmm. you and i talking like that i mean i started a another youtube channel and podcast in the financial space and it's been amazing to see the difference like i'm those aren't high production quality videos mm -hmm. but they get insane watch time because the topic and the information and the engagement is there and so i don't think you know i think relieving yourself of that pressure is the thing that's gonna maybe help somebody to say 
I'm going to hit publish on this, even though it's not perfect. Yeah. And, and somebody on the chat also just said, like, it's just a matter of time management. And, and I think what what you're saying is the opposite. And, and I think I don't want to I don't want people to think that, like, what we're saying is you have to create a, a studio that's based on partially social media content, partially, you know, just doing design work, et cetera. It's no do what you're doing, but just have the cognitive, you know, the, 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 the awareness to say, maybe I should just document this. And it doesn't have to be video, right? Just choose a mechanism, totally. Instagram, yeah. Twitter, you know, choose one of them. Facebook doesn't really matter. Just choose one and then say, okay, while I'm doing this project, I'm just going to put my iPhone on, on record up here. I'm going to press screen record. Um, it doesn't take any more time because all you're doing is recording the time that you already took to do it. Right. And if you, and just publishing that, and, and I just have a feeling that that, that in general, if, if, if anyone building a business uh, in, in architecture thinks about that, immediately you're going to differentiate yourself, right? I, I just, yeah, I just I mean, think you, it's huge. You have to do marketing anyway. It's, it's not like if you right. decide not to not to put the camera over your desk, yep. you don't have to market. Yep. You still have, it's still a job that you have to do. So all I'm doing is, and maybe this is the, the comment about time management, is yep. all I'm doing is stacking those two on top of each other. Like right. I'm putting it in the same space because I can. And yep. Um, you know, if I look back at some of my more popular videos on the channel, I literally just did that, Jeff. I, I put a camera overhead and I, I would get frustrated. Like there, there's a moment in this video I made, uh, I think it was back in 2018, something like that. And it was like a day in the life kind of video. And mm. I was sketching this elevation and I got really annoyed because I just wasn't looking the way I wanted to look. And like, that is the most popular part of the video. It's completely right. unscripted. It's just me going, no, this sucks. You know, this, I can't, I can't live with this. This sucks. And I'm going to, and then I leave the studio and like, that's real. Those real moments are the things that hit because they, everybody feels that, you know, it doesn't have to be the highly produced million subs guy version of what a video is. I do that in many ways, just because that's what lights me up creatively. Like I yep. love doing that, but it, it's not what's right for everybody. Definitely. So we're going to take a quick break. And when we get back from this ad reel, um, we're going to dive into a little bit more geeky technological stuff, but also process stuff, analog, which digital. I think I want to I want to dive into that because I think some people are super <laughs> interested in in how how you approach some of your processes. And most people out there are going to be architects and engineers in the audience and and we'll love to see us go down the rabbit hole a little bit. So uh, for, with that, let me just run run the ad reel real quick and then we'll jump back into the discussion. <laughs> All right, so this season and this episode of BIM After Dark Live was sponsored by RevitFamily.biz. If you saw last week's episode, Brenton Weiberg, who's the creator of that business, speaking of entrepreneurs and, 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 and having a firm and, and, and doing something else with it, he also develops um, residential uh, Revit family, fully customizable parametric families. If you're interested, head on over to RevitFamily.biz, use the offer code REVITKID23 to save 20% and support those who support this channel. Um, you guys have heard it before, you've seen his content, and definitely check it out. So, uh, as as you saw, we, we, I think we left off in a, in a good spot, Eric. Where, um, you know, we're talking about sort of these two separate pieces. You know, there's there's the firm being developed. There's this other this other arm of things happening um, while you're doing it. But at the same time, I think there is, and, and actually, I think the time management question is probably a good way to fold into this um, because, to some extent, what we're saying to get started, you don't need to 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 spend more necessarily more time um, on one versus the other. You know, like you said, overlapping them. Over time, though, right? Uh, you know, video production and and if you want to create products and there's there, there's that can start pulling away from time on the architecture side. And I know for a fact that you are somebody who spent a, a lot of time um, creating processes and procedures and and whatnot on the architecture side. Um, and I would imagine that because those exist, the efficiencies there exist. It allowed you to spend the time on the other stuff. So um, I guess maybe. Walk through sort of your ethos as you're building this build this business ten years ago, um, and, and I'm not just talking about production of drawings. I'm talking about um, the general processes of being a self <laughs> self employed architect, as a sole proprietor architect, and all the other crap that goes along with it. Not just doing the documents. So was this was 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 the idea of setting up these these procedures and this efficiency and these templates and these documents was that something that was in your mind right away or, or was there a moment where you decided i needed to make this more efficient i needed to develop this process 
Yeah. <laughs> I mean, all of this can look like um, I was laser focused on some kind of <laughs> ideal working process right, right. Uh, over time. <laughs> but I think the reality of this is it's really, really messy. Hmm. And I think, you know, the early days of the business when I was completely overwhelmed and working on five different projects at once and trying to keep all those balls in the air, I just realized that if I didn't find a better way of, of managing the business um, and then it just was unsustainable. I was going to go back to work for somebody else and I didn't want to do that. So, you know, there was, there's this essay called um, uh, Maker Schedule, Manager's Schedule. It's by Paul Graham, founder of Y Combinator. Um, beautiful essay. It'll take you five minutes to read it. Um, but that was kind of a pivotal turning point for me and my business. Um, and if anyone has downloaded my Notion template, I use Notion to run my entire business right now. It's kind of productivity uh, tool, uh, essentially. But I de- divide my schedule into making in the morning and managing in the afternoon. I was a very hard line division there um, because what I found as a sole practitioner was, you know, I'd get started designing something, working on a set of elevations or, or whatever a creative task I was doing. Yep. And then I'd get interrupted by a, a contractor. We all know this experience, right? And then there's a switching cost between moving from the making side, the creative you know, side of your brain to the managing side of your brain. And so I I very, at at a certain point, I very ruthlessly oriented my schedule to making in the morning because that's when I felt most creative. And I would get up very, very early. I don't do this anymore. (laughs) I don't get up at 4 a.m. anymore, but I used to when I was first running the business. And um, I would set that time from about 4 a.m. till about noon, Hmm. all my making tasks there. And then any meetings, any management stuff, invoicing, emails, client phone calls, anything like that would all get stacked into the afternoon. And so that was a, a very broad brush way of organizing my thinking w- right. with respect to the business. And um, over time that's evolved, you know, using a tool like Notion has allowed me to over time kind of plug in these SOPs and systems. And so, you know, what I found was if I was doing a task, a repetitive task and I needed to farm it out or, you know, there was something that I couldn't quite remember, mm-hmm. I just created an SOP in Notion, you know, that gets its own checklist mm-hmm. kind of thing. I was using Trello at, at first, but now right. I'm, I'm no longer using that, you know. And this whole system can exist for SD, DD, CDs, this whole thing. And, you know, I, I built this set of tools for me to be more productive and to ease the sort of mental burden of running the practice. Um, and over time, I just thought like, you know, as I fill these things in, I'm just going to turn that into a product and, and sell it itself. So it, it it happened incrementally. It wasn't like I had this grand plan to make this this all happen. But, you know, what I realized, I think, in the process of doing that, Jeff, was just like – there's so much to manage here that there's no way I can do this for five projects and keep it sustainable all at once. So that was really the point when I said, all right, it needs to be like one or two at most, like one in design, one in construction. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, no, 100%. And 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 again, it, it, it even ties back to the original conversation of sort of like, you developed this toolkit, which, you know, at the time, I think it started out as what probably just a bunch of Word documents in a, in a folder structure, right? If I remember correctly, and then sort yeah. of folded into, into your Notion template and whatnot. But but then you realize there was some value, um, and and you shared it, right? And 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 you know that just goes along with with the other idea too. Like like so many firms out there are, are you know, want to keep that as proprietary information for themselves. Right. There's so much value to to sharing that, and 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 it's not just your competition gets to see what you're doing. Like there's there's, there's a lot more value to it. But but it's also interesting because um, you know as I mentioned, it started it's if you know it started as sort of a folder structure with documents and 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 whatnot, and sort of evolved into into um, into Notion, um, which you know anyone who hasn't dove into the world of Notion definitely definitely worth doing it. Um, uh, and and Eric's got a bunch of great videos on it for our specific industry and how it can work. But just in general, um, if you're if you're using OneNote for example, this is like OneNote on steroids. It is just so like there's so so much more that that you can do with it. But but that's an interesting um, thought and, and process and sort of evolution because I know you know I, I know you you, you always you, you have uh, you know the the idea of analog versus digital is very important to you and 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 sticking to um, the analog approaches of, of sketching and model making, et cetera, you know, that tactile stuff. Um, but you're still, you're not, you're not someone who's afraid to embrace technology when, you know, when it, when it seems right. And I think that's a good example there is, is, you know, the transition from a folder structure in, in file explorer in, in Mac or whatever, right. Or windows, whatever you're using, uh, to sort of a, a database almost online of the similar processes. Um, I'm curious, um, you know, I know, I know you've spent a lot of time, um, 
getting better and evolving with the iPad as a sketching tool. And so I'm sort of curious that that transition, I mean, I know you're still probably doing both just like all of us are, but but I know you, you definitely do more iPad sketching than probably you used to. And so I'm curious, um, you know, what did that look like? Was that more of a, a convenience thing? Was that more of uh, the tools finally got to a point where you thought it was this, this, it was something that, that, that could transition kind of like the folders to notion. You know, was there a point yeah. where you're like, maybe I can go from trace to iPad at some point in time? <laughs> yeah, it's interesting that it's an interesting, um, opening here. I mean, I think of technology, I just want to kind of step back mm. talking about technology. I mean, technology is many different things. I mean, mm. technology is a pencil, True. right? I mean, right. technology is not only things that are new or cutting mm. edge or twin motion or what, whatever the latest plugin for mm. Revit is. I mean, it's, it's a book. It's, it's a way to share ideas. It's a process. Mm. Like for me, technology is this big thing. Yeah. And, and it's funny, um, you know, it, it's, it, it's kind of a means to getting a result. And, and if I think about the iPad and how the iPad came to be integrated into my practice, I had resisted it for a long time because, you know, I started sketching on a, a few different apps. Like I started with Morfolio's Trace app. Yep, yep. Um, friend had it in the studio. I was like, oh, what's this like? And there was like a lag mm. on the pencil. And I was like, okay, this is just, this does not <laughs> compute for my brain. And, 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 I think what changed for me was when I got one in 2020 and I started using Procreate and I realized that the app has a lot to do with how comfortable I am with the tool. Mm. Um, it, it's less about sort of resisting uh, one tool over another. It's which tool is the right tool for the job. And when I started using, and I don't know, do you use Procreate? I do. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 I don't, I don't use it as much. I, you know, I'm, okay. I'm more marking up sketches on, on it. So it's less, it's less uh, art, artistic sketching on the iPad, but more convenience okay. of like drawing on top of other things. So not as much, but yes, I, I've definitely used it. Yep. Yeah. So, I mean, there's, there's a haptic thing that happens mm. for me. It's, it's the reason I build, still build physical models because mm. I can get different things from the analog world than I can get from the digital world. And I need both. I, I want both in my mm. life. And the iPad is this kind of funny confluence of having a stylus in your hand, mm -hmm. which is like a pencil, yep. but it doesn't have the, it's, you know, you're scraping across this glass screen. And once I got a paper like screen protector mm -hmm. for it, you know, something which creates some friction. So it simulates a sketchbook and I started using it in Procreate and I can use any brush I want. Like I have a whole entire art store right at my fingertips. To me, right. that was a complete unlock here. Mm -hmm. And so that, and when I'm using the app, there's no lag or delay. What, what I'm sketching on the screen looks how it should look on paper. And that I found that to be a pretty special connection for myself. And I don't know if you're like this too, but it, um, I always loved using like watercolors or marker mm -hmm. on like a tooth paper, but I can't stand the way it sounds. Like it's just, <laughs> uh, it's like nails on a chalkboard for me. But here I can use, I can use chalk on a chalkboard here and it's not bothersome to me. Yeah, and so yeah. that as a tool, and, and I really do use it probably more so weighted toward artistic work mm -hmm. than I do for something like marking up a set of drawings. Like mm -hmm. that, that need is just lower for me because mm -hmm. the volume of projects in my studio is lower, but the utility of it is just massive to have a set of drawings in your hand while you're out on site rather than having to have a roll with you. Like right. it's just, the stupid how useful it is but mm -hmm. you know procreate is that perfect intersection for me between the digital and the analog world and i mean undo in a sketchbook like right. it makes it hard to go back to the sketchbook i have to say <laughs> as someone a purveyor of sketchbooks right. myself it makes it hard but you know i i don't think i'll ever give up physical sketching yeah. in the world in the same way that i won't give up model making because it's just you know there's a there's a, a gap when I'm creating something, let, let's say it's a physical cardboard model, mm -hmm. right? I, I can't make that a perfect thing. It's not gonna be a perfect building. I'm not gonna get the overhangs right, mm -hmm. like, but I'm going for something close. And, and when you render it like that, just like a sketch, there's some sort of gap in what I've rendered in physical space. Mm -hmm. And when you put that in front of a client and you're standing there, you're both looking at the model, they're filling in a different gap mm -hmm. than you're filling in. Mm -hmm. and, and that's, for me, the space for invention. And, and I feel like the iPad allows that to happen for me now too, that mm. there's, there's this imperfection to it. And mm. I think, you know, if we, if we talk about using digital tools, you know, um, when you can do anything, you do nothing, right? You, you want some kind of constraints here. And so for me, sometimes these things have, a, a some constraints to me, like what I can do and what I can't do, mm -hmm. um, that helps shape the work. You know, I think the technology and the tools that you use, they, 
architecture is so process driven, they can't help but shape the kind of work that you make, the kind of tools you use shape the kind of work that you make. Right, right. No, I love that. I think uh, one of the I'd love to pick apart the the model making a little bit because I think it's something interesting um, where um, even now you're starting to see in education less of it, but it's still there. But I've definitely seen, you know, as as you go further on in your in your educational journey, uh, less requirements for model making, et cetera, um, be, you know, and whatnot. And so I guess my and, and I love the idea of, of, of that gap. And, and I never I never really thought of it too much because um, I guess because I, I I guess there's two ethos to it, right? The one is one is to, 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 to present the, the polished product and let them react to uh, sure. what you see is the f- final and then it's more like a, de- a de- deductive sort of process where it's like you know they're like eh, you know I'm you know, now they're looking at this final thing as opposed to like uh, a more conceptual mass and they're and they're filling in the gap so I, I guess they, I can see kind of both sides of it but um, it's interesting because when you look at especially larger firms um, for example there's very little model making happening as much as you see. and there's some sure more of it's more of like a marketing piece for like the client to have or something like that from what I what I can tell um, do you I mean what what do you feel I mean like why why do you think that is like do you think that that piece of what you were saying there is kind of gone from the process for the sake of efficiency time money all that stuff um, um, or or is it um, is it the process or our thought process has changed I mean I mean because I, I never really thought about it that way um, Maybe well, look, I mean, I don't know ahead. that we can say that model making is gone from these big firms. Like, go look at a firm like Studio Zunthor. Yeah. They're still making models. I mean, I think it's it's the process that you bake into it. And I think, yeah. you know, you can make the argument that, okay, that's a rarefied process. Like, mm-hmm. you know, Studio Leapskins. Like, okay, maybe they're still making models. But mm-hmm. to me, you, you do that because you get different things out of the tools. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, if I were to hop right into Revit, number one, I don't even know how to use Revit, <laughs> frankly. <laughs> but it, but let's just say I did. Let's say I got into Revit and I wanted to design something with a barrel vault. You know, mm. I, if I don't know how to make a barrel vault, guess what? We're not getting from the design. Right. Right. So I think you know the the physical model making, the act of that. You know, it just produces different results. It allows you, it avails you different mm-hmm. means of creativity. And I'm not pretending that that's the right process for everybody. And I actually am so far removed from what they're doing in school today that I can't say for sure whether or not model making is still a part of, you know, and maybe you have more of a connection to it. I don't know. But um, and, and the same goes for individual practices. I think everybody evolves a process that works for them that yields the best results. If, if it were me uh, trying to present a fully finished materialed out model for somebody as a schematic design like i think is sometimes the expectation of people Mm -hmm. to me that's jumping the gun it's just it it doesn't work for my process because i can't get to how do i know the the skin wants to be metal versus stone in the beginning maybe i don't know that you know and and i think it's it's hard it's hard to draw those lines so early i mean i'd be curious to to know about you because i know you are presenting kind of these photorealistic models to your clients and things mm-hmm. like that. I mean, you're you're making all of those decisions for them. Do you feel at the time you're making those decisions? Do you be, are you prepared to make those? Like, isn't isn't it like doesn't the rendering always just need a little bit more? Like, there's just not enough resolution. Yeah, I mean, I, I think to some extent. I mean, uh, you know, usually with that, you know, what I'm doing is yeah, I'm I'm tying together a bunch of inspiration. You know, materiality is usually something that you know, we'll talk about at least and, and whatnot. I'm also not afraid to swap out and twit and show them four or five options within that environment. But you make a, a valid point in the sense that like, um, yeah, va- you know, models aren't necessarily gone. I do see plenty of firms that are using them. But I think the purpose for them is different is, is what is what I'm getting at, right? The purpose that you're talking about makes makes so much sense as a as a design tool, right? A, a, design tool, a, you know, sure. You're sitting there and, 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 and you know, you're basically using the model as a sketch, right? Which, which was always in school. That was always my favorite sketch models. was pretty, I, I never wanted to go beyond sketch models because I just enjoyed it so much more. And then once we got beyond it, then I would just go on the computer because I can still do it. Right. And, sure. And, and that's the polished piece. But I loved sketch models, right? That, that, that to me has always been super fun. But well, let I, me I, stop you there because yeah, like yeah. when you do the sketch model, right? And mm-hmm. you take the sketch model and then you put it into the computer. Mm-hmm. What's that feeling that you get? Something is always lost. 
the, yeah well there's there's a sense of right there's there's a sense of pragmatism that has to hit it right because now it's to scale it's to right there, there's there's all of that but i'm also you know to, to the, the other point you made when you're confident enough with a tool whether it's a pencil whether it's a sure. sketchbook exacto knife yeah, yeah. or whether it's revit or sketchup or whatever tool it is i totally get then it you don't feel the restriction anymore um and 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 it's more of like to me, actually, that transition, even from sketch to Revit, like, because I, you know, if it, everyone who sees my process, I go back and forth a lot. Um, it's yeah. actually almost more validating the concept than anything else. It's like, you know, I just sketch this four or five times, not even to scale, generally to scale, whatever. And then I put it in, oh, look at that, it did work. Oh, no, I was way off with my in my opinions on, you know. So I guess maybe yeah. that's that's where the transition is, the validation. To me, when I'm seeing physical models these days, um, especially the larger firms, you know, it's it's usually like an army of interns that are, you know, asked to do it and not the people designing the buildings. And it's more of a, it seems like it's more of a showpiece to design, you know, to, it, and it's, I guess what I'm getting, when you, when you put it in that frame, it's way less of a tool to me and more of, more of just, we're doing this to show like a different medium of presenting the design we designed and less of like, we're using this to actually design the design, right? <laughs> I get and that, but and, yeah, and, and, yeah. I just took a model making course. Uh, Morphosis had a, their model awesome. maker, they, they made a, a course mm -hmm. on that, which I, admittedly, like I was like, oh, that's a model shop I'd love to work in, right? It's complete <laughs> separate division. And yeah, they're, yeah. they've been an inspiration to me for my entire career. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, they still use models as yeah. physical tools. And I think, um, whether or not it's part of your process, you know, we all went to school with people who hated making sketch models. You and I both loved it, but yeah. th there was plenty of people who were like, I have to make a model, really? And so yeah. I'm not pretending this is an ideal or optimized <laughs> part of the process, but I'll, I'll promise you, when you put a model in front of a client, and even when it's sketched, let's say it's three different models, like little sketch versions of what their house might be, you get a different set of results there. Right. You just you just do. And it, it's for me, it's... Um, it's baking into the process a dialogue saying to them that the house isn't done. We're still working on it. Like mm. this is this is part of a larger framework that we're, we're thinking about things. And this is how it could change over time. And I find that exciting. I, I, I mean, if I had the skills that you had in Revit, I might feel differently. Mm. You know, I mean, I use Procreate. You use a physical sketchbook. And I think, yeah. you know, this discussion about technology is what is the right technology for the job and how how do you remove friction? from mm -hmm. doing what you need to do. And it, that sounds like it's a great process for you, but I always feel like there is something that's lost in that process, moving from that sketch study model and making it reality. And for me, that's an AutoCAD. Yeah, I'm still a dinosaur. I'm still using the very, very rudimentary tools, <laughs> but you know, it, um, but then at a certain point, you find the life in it again. And, and you're, I'm using the digital tools to refine and using it for precision and graphic convention. And, and that has its own set of, you know, things that light me up. Like mm -hmm. I'd never give that, that part of the process up. I love, I love how that happens and evolves over time. I love seeing a set of construction documents come together. It's, it's amazing. Yeah, no. And, and, and I, I love that. I think uh, it's interesting um, to sort of think about, I'm, I'm trying to think the, the client's perspective on how, how all this unfolds too. And, and it is interesting. Sure. Um, I, I have to imagine at some point, and it, it's very client dependent, right? There's, there's different types of clients out there too, who, who can, who can, who can, fill in those gaps that you're talking sure. about, right? And there may be it's, some that can't, right? And so so I think I think there's also that that aspect of it a little bit uh, in the sense that, um, I, I'm, I'm, sorry, I'm sorry, I'm just picturing a client, uh, <laughs> this client I used to have who was like very high end, uh, you know, <laughs> and I just can't imagine how, how she would have reacted if I came in with a cardboard model just for the sake right. of like, I'm paying you to make a cardboard model. Like what? <laughs> like, and that maybe she wouldn't, I don't know. I just, I could just imagine that. But I guess what I'm getting at is like, um, I think at some point in time too, there's, there's also um, different clients in mind, different presentation modes and just having the ability to, to do those different ways. So to be able to present things differently um, based on, you know, what you want the output from is, is yeah. And I, right? I think, you know, clients hire you, they hire you for your design process more right. than anything else, right? There's an outcome. They see the outcome in your portfolio and they're buying the process in between. And I'm very upfront about how these things are created and what the costs are going to be. And I don't pretend that's going to work for everybody, but without that process, like I, I'm not going to do it. Right. It's you're buying my process. So like, if you don't like the fact that I made a cardboard model, then it's, you're probably better off working with somebody else. And so I think, yeah, it's a discussion you have to have up front. I mean, I thought you were going to say, 
uh, she made the literal connection that her house was going to be made out of cardboard. Which, that, I mean, you know, there, may be, there may be some that do that too, but potentially, right? <laughs> what is this right. chipboard material? I've never seen this before. <laughs> but in the no. same way, you know, if I present like, let's say a SketchUp massing model, which, um, you know, I haven't added materials to yet because we're just figuring out the, the roof lines and things like that, right? A certain subset of clients are going to say, well, is the house going to be white like that? Mm. But right. White and gray? I don't. I don't like that. You know, they can't they can't right. make that leap. And so for me, sometimes moving into the d digital world is like you have to make it beautiful and precise yeah. in a way that I'm just not ready to do yet. And yeah. you know, I have a lot of um, respect for guys like you, Jeff, because you you can make that leap faster than I can. And um, I, and I think there's so much space to innovate here. I mean, you know, we haven't even touched on AI or any of those yeah. tools that you know skin your models and in materials and things. And and you know, there's a lot of things wrong with that. But I think you know, maybe filling in some of the gaps for people who are a little more anti-technology when it comes to rendering, like yeah. that's a good thing. Because when you get to the point where you're looking at interiors, sometimes it's not enough to have the materials in your hand and yeah. be standing in the space and saying, this is what I'm thinking here. You know, yeah. people can't make that leap, right. which is where renderings come in. I just have a hard time doing that like right out of the gate. That's just not part of my process yeah yeah and, and I, I get what you're saying I think uh, I think the I think I had to get to a point where um, I was comfortable enough knowing that even though I'm making a polished image I, I'm comfortable that knowing that it's going to change and change often right I think that's sure. part I think it's part of the, the restriction too it's not just the because like I said it, to me it becomes more of like a deductive thing where it's like like you know they look at it like well, that wasn't what I was thinking at all. Well, let's talk about that. What were you thinking? And then sometimes they'll pull up like an image of something or they'll, you know, this thing. So it's, it's a little bit of the backwards, but I think, you know, it does require a lot of commitment on the digital front <laughs> to, to get to that point. And you got to sure. be okay with, with changing that piece of it, as opposed to the sketch model, which I think becomes a lot easier to, to modify some things, you know, just rip off the, the corner here and, and, you know, tape it back on the backside or whatever. Right. And so totally. I, I do think it's a different, a different ethos. And, and I think, I think I've probably just found, um, I found it a lot easier to, to work with, to work with them when they or the clients who, who, who can't, I mean, I, I don't think I've worked with a client who could see that beyond you know, like conceptual, beyond that conceptual piece well, per se. Sure. Yeah. I mean, cause <laughs> uh, you could have the opposite thing that happens where you spend time hmm. rendering out six different options and they're like, you just rendered out six different options. Like I hate stone or what, you know, whatever you chose to render, you know I mean? I'm sure right, you've been right. in that position before yep. too. So 100%. yeah, it's yeah, a here's funny option thing, A, B man. and C. And then you end up doing option D. You're like, well, <laughs> these are the options A, B and C that we talked about. <laughs> <Totally>. <laughs> um, no, I, I think, I think it's all great and valid and, and, and it is something to think about, you know, this this channel what i talk about is very tool oriented right I and mean, just just sure. that's the way i've sort of developed it but part of the reason why i wanted you to come on is to have this 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 discussion because i, I think especially as sole proprietors right um when i think of um even six twelve you know medium to, to large firms right there, there becomes a certain point where i think um the tools become important for efficiency for and 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 um, you know, and time management, and, and you know, like we were talking about lump sum versus hourly, et cetera, right? Where where it makes sense to to be able to document a building in in you know fifty six percent less time because of the scale and blah blah blah, blah right? But I do think sole practitioners, it, it's a different area where, like you were saying, like you have more control over those things that in theory you could design the process uh, and 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 the tools could be you know, used for that process. And that's why, you know, I've never, I've never given you a hard time for not coming out of the AutoCAD world, uh, because for you, it, it clearly is a process that works. And it, it's a process that, that you're not losing money doing, right? Um, you know, and, and it, it's part of what you do. But, but I'm curious to, to know, like, um, you know, as you've probably, you know, seen over the years, a lot of the transition for probably a lot of your colleagues and whatnot to, uh, BIM, whether it's ArchiCAD, whether it's Revit, whether it's Vectorworks, uh, Chief Architect, whatever, right? Um, you know, what, was there a moment where you thought maybe I should jump into this and 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 see if 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 it if it improves, if it whatever, and then it didn't, or or was it more of the things where you're like, no, th this process works for me. There's there's I'm I'm approaching fifty, eh, not <laughs> one of those things. You know, what what like like how did that? Because I I have to imagine over the last ten years, especially, um, you know, you you've You've probably seen and heard the marketing machine of, of Autodesk or just in general across the, the country, um, you know, 
the the ad- adoption of of BIM and not necessarily Revit, just the tool. Um, so I'm curious, sort of, when you've how you, as you've been seeing this and watching it unfold, like what what have your been been your thoughts on it? For you personally, yeah, I, <laughs> I, I mean, for me personally, of course. I, I mean, I, I'd be crazy not to see the evolution of that, um, the BIM space, and and feel like I wasn't participating in the efficiencies of that. But mm-hmm. you know, I think it comes down to, um, for me, about being intentional about what I want, mm-hmm. and what I want out of this business is to feed a giant creative life that I have. And you know, if BIM is a part of that creative life and strikes my fancy, I, I'm going to incorporate it. And if it's not, it's going to be, it's going to remain a satellite in the constellation of things that I enjoy doing. And right. so I can see for you, I mean, you built a whole channel around right. this, right? The Revikid. And it's cool. It's amazing. I mean, I'm, I'm jealous of you guys that have adopted this and been able to make it a part of your workflow. Mm. I haven't found that same love for it. Mm. I, I, every set of drawings that I've, you know, sort of been interacted with, I just don't love the way they look. And I, for me, you know, and that's not to say yours aren't, aren't better or whatever, because I, honestly, I don't spend a lot of time looking at it. But for me, the process of making a, a, a finely delineated drawing in AutoCAD is so easy and frictionless hmm. that I just say, okay, well, if the result, you know, the end result here is this architectural form built in 3D space. And AutoCAD is one of the tools that I use in that continuum of the process of getting there. I'm happy with that. Like that works for me. Um, does it mean that I would have a more efficient process if I used Revit instead? Maybe, but I'm not optimizing for efficiency. I, I, I don't think anyone could say, you know, that my business is built in the most efficient way because I didn't set it up that way. I didn't optimize for that. There are certain firms that need it to be optimized for that or they don't exist. And right. like I'm, I'm all for this inclusive space, which says your practice and creative process looks that way and mine looks this way. And as long as you're being open and honest with your clients about what they're getting, like, yeah, I mean, if you want to hire somebody because their process is 20% more efficient and it costs 20% less, then that's the person you should hire because I'm not the most efficient guy. And that's just a process that works for me. And I'm not sure I'll ever incorporate it. I think it's an amazing tool, but there are other pieces of technology, which, you know, like chat GPT and Mm -hmm. things in the AI world and NFTs that I find infinitely fascinating. And like, to me, in the constellation of things that I could do, I'm headed there because I, I see different possibilities and innovations, you know, and as you get to be my age, like, I don't know, I'm, I'm ready to explore new and different things and not necessarily like make more efficient a process that are having in place. Yeah, um, yeah. So I don't know if that's just an old man answer or what. <laughs> no, no, no. I, no. I think it's great. I think, uh, I, I think again, I mean, that, that's, that's the sort of one of the overarching themes of, of, cause for, I mean, I had Jared Banks on two weeks ago and he's a, he's a, you know, he, he's, he's an Archicad user. And so, yeah. you know, p- part of the, part of the reason for this season, especially inviting on such different guests is, is again opening the eyes of, of us Revit users who go right down the rabbit hole and, and, and just remembering that. And, and, and that's why I do, I wanted you to answer that because I, I know, you know, I, I know it, it's, it, it's a, it's a purposeful, you know, there's a, there's a reason why, you know, you didn't just jump on the bandwagon, right? It, there's a reason for it. Um, and, and I think that's important for people to understand. It's also, you know, like you said, I think you've set up a business and, and a model that allows you to make that decision where maybe, you know, there's like, you know, certain firms, if you're doing K through 12 schools and you have 60 people, then the efficiency of, of adopting BIM is, is going to oh, be yeah. there, right? I mean, it's because yeah. now it's less about that and more about the efficiency, whatever, right? Um, but they're so, not looking to someone like me for for inspiration, man. <laughs> they they look at me and laugh, honestly. Right. You know, I mean, well, a lot of people yeah. just laugh at the kind of business that I have. But for me, it's an intentional choice to make a life that it makes me happy. And I, yeah. you know, that's what I love about this. And I and I love having this conversation and this dialogue because oftentimes I think it can just be really adversarial. Like people see me as just rejecting BIM. Yeah, it, yeah. It's just, it's another tool in the toolbox, right? I mean, you right. still sketch, yeah. like 100%. you're finding utility in those analog tools. 100%. And so I, I, I don't ever want to see those analog tools go away, I guess. And it's not mm-hmm. just for kind of posterity's sake or, you know, I, I just feel like there's value there. And um, I hope that doesn't get lost. Yeah. And that's exactly why, you know, I mean, it's taken me a while to, to, to create a process for me that makes it at like like you said frictionless right the idea is frictionless between in in your process yeah. so so i think and and i did want everyone on the channel to, to just realize that like you can be a successful architect sole practitioner architect 
and not use Revit. <laughs> it's, it's, you know, I, it's cause you know, I, I've been saying it for so many years, obviously I'm a big proponent of the tool, but, but, but it's, it's plausible, it's possible and it, and it, and it happens. Right. And, but, but again, there's, there's an intention there. And I think that's the important piece too, is, is understanding your intentions, understanding you guys out there, what your intentions are and, and, and sticking to that. Right. I could have came, we could, yeah, you could have came on here and we could have just shamed you for an hour about how you're not using BIM and Revit, <laughs> but that wouldn't have been kind of you know, productive for anybody. And, and, you know, <laughs> and so we don't want to do that, but, uh, no, this has been an awesome conversation. Uh, there's been a couple chat guesses in here or, or chats in here. Not too many questions. There's a, a lot of people telling us their um, their hobbies as architects, which is really funny. Oh, awesome! <laughs> Some yeah, what do you got? Tell woodworkers me. and jewelers. I mean, you name it, like all this stuff, and it just cracks me up because it's so it's so on mm. brand, so on brand for what we do. <laughs> I love it, man. Yeah, that's uh, great. No, this uh, has been a great conversation. I appreciate you having me here. Yeah, definitely. I appreciate you coming on. Uh, where where can people best uh, reach out, contact, connect with you? 30by40.com, all spelled out. Uh, you can find me on YouTube, 30by40, the numbers. Awesome. awesome. I'll, put, I'll put all the links 40. below as well. Um, also links to, to your your sketchbooks, your uh, awesome. uh, all, all the great content that you have, some of your, you, even the, the standard operating procedures. I know you're doing some sort of a, a course or a, tool, or a toolkit with a course, I think, for, for architects trying to sort of start their thing, right? Um, so, yep, absolutely. So I'll make yep. sure to put links to that. I know people are interested in Procreate and the Notion template, and I, I'll put links to all those. All of those. Uh, I'm pretty sure you have even some YouTube videos that show the Notion template a little bit, right? Behind I do. Yeah, two yeah, yeah. two videos, and then the template is totally free. And I made it just for architects and interior designers. So yeah, awesome. go grab it. Well, Eric, thank <laughs> you so much for joining. I really appreciate it. Any final Pleasure. words for uh, the, the audience before we wrap up? No, man, I, I end my videos just by saying, go make things. And yep. however best you can make things, uh, yep. that's what I use, whatever tools are at hand. I love that. Yep. Everyone go make things. Doesn't matter what tool you're using. Doesn't matter what you're making, guitar, jewelry, whatever, right? right. Just, just, go, just go make things. Eric, thank you so much. I appreciate it. And uh, you guys, thanks for joining. Um, I'll see you again next week. And, uh, and make sure you subscribe to the channel if you enjoyed this content. And with that, I will uh, bid you all adieu. Thanks, guys. Thanks.